Well, it is a problem. There's no question about that. And how you uh, can stop that, you know, stop the opiates and that is education. You know, going into schools at an early age, talking about um, talking about opiates and what, you know, because heroin and fentanyl are part of the opiates. They are part of it. They are, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so you need education, you need methadone clinics. And I read somewhere, and I think it was in the Sun, that uh, people don't want methadone uh, clinics in their neighborhood. There was two cases of that in Bremerton, yeah. But the thing is, is that that's debunked by all the research, is that there is no more crime uh, with methadone clinics than if it was just a house, you know. So, because you have to bring people off of the drug. Have you ever visited one? A methadone? Yeah, no, I haven't. Have you? I have not. That oh. was, but that was when, when we were reporting on that in Bremerton. Yeah. Um, the proposal here, that was, um, people liked a site, that, uh, there was one in Federal Way or somewhere oh. like that, that had a bad reputation. And they said, you need to come see this to yeah. see whether, and I don't know if it was crime per se, or just people hanging out, um, or that drug dealers, be. drug dealers hanging out, knowing there's these people coming in and out. And so right. that was the, that's why I asked. Yeah, you know, they did a lot of mm -hmm. research on that, and they said there's no more crime statistically than... And, that, and that's to say, the people that are getting treatment are not committing crimes within that. Right, that, that right. Is. And that's so out of the... they have to be in the neighborhood? I'm sorry? Why does the methadone treatment center have to be in the neighborhood? It doesn't. It doesn't. It just but that's to where... access to public transportation. Right, yeah. Um, but... The National Institutes of Health have, uh, they were the ones who did the study. And also, we also have, so, uh, well. I'm actually going to ask one other thing about what Jim said with the neighborhood. Yeah. Because one of the reasons, I mean, one of the reasons it was directed towards the place it was in the situation here right. was the availability of the building. Right. Back. I mean, the business owner wanted to put it there. But the other element was there's, there's zoning regulation. They right. only put it in certain places. Now, is that something that this, would you see, do you see that as a hindrance? Well, it depends on if it's commercial, industrial, and that, I don't have any problem with that. If it's uh, single family homes, it might just stick out looking a little strange. But again, you need to have transportation. You need to be close. To where people are. And but, but in these neighborhoods, there is bus transportation, isn't there? Isn't that where the buses go? Oh, yeah. Okay. I lost you there. I'm sorry. No, I, think you, I actually think you were agreeing on that. Yeah, on we were that. agreeing on that. Um, what I was curious is, do, do you, when you, if, as you reviewed kind of how zoning, are, are methadone clinics, do they have a hard time because of zoning restrictions? I don't know. I, I didn't read anything where I saw zoning was a problem. Um, it, zoning could be a big problem, but most cities want to see the heroin uh, epidemic go down. And so you have to go. And also, I think that to help with uh, overdoses and that, you've got Narcan, which uh, revives people. Did you vote for that bill? Yes. There's a bill that allowed mm -hmm. first responders here. You were in favor Yeah, of I, I can't imagine somebody really voting against it because then the person would die. But this way you get to revive them. You've got to take them to the hospital right away. Should Narcan but, be available in schools? Yeah, it should. I don't mean just an everybody's no, 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 desk. No, a, a nurse or something <coughs> like that. Yes, I think it should be available. I think that we have to make kids understand that, you know, uh, the heroin and the fentanyl and all that is just, it's really bad. And that, you know, 
you teach them in schools, you show them if one of their friends overdoses, you know, how you use the Narcan. But with the Narcan, you have to get that person to the hospital. You know, you just can't, when they revive, you can't just walk away because they're going to go back in if we don't get them to the hospital. Um, you work on social services. You, you uh -huh. have done that during your, during your tenure. Right. Is the support from the state for things like treatment, um, drug treatment in communities, do you think it's adequate? Or what, what kind of have you done during your tenure? Well, I don't think it's adequate. But that's because for eight years, you know, during the Great Recession, we kept cutting programs because they were the discretionary monies. We couldn't touch the line items or the mandates, so we had to get discretionary money, and that was part of it. But do I think that we're, I think we're going to put more money into it because it's really a drain on the state and on the city and the county uh, and you know going to emergency rooms doing all of that that's expensive where is the money best spent if it sounds oh. like you're, you're optimistic that the legislature would address that yeah this year. where where is the state money best spent um, going towards i would think schools Do, with the education part with of the, the education part rather of than it. rather than treatment facilities well or, you can have treatment facilities, but that doesn't mean that the state's going to give all the money to methadone clinics. But they have to give money to the schools. Because look at what we've done with smoking. You know, kids are not smoking, which is wonderful. And uh, so I think this will go with it. And uh, hopefully, just say no. Do you, you think the laws on, on drug dealers are um, go far enough? Yeah, I do. I do. If they're, well, it depends on the type of drug dealer, but most drug dealers are selling uh, their wares because they're using. And so what you have is people who are using and are addicted and they go to jail, they don't get any treatment. So my mine would be to see both the dealers and the users get treatment. Okay, so I think Sherry, it's, yeah. the, the problem that I see with this is that we have this mm -hmm. epidemic situation mm -hmm. in, in our state, mm -hmm. Kitsap County, etc. And you say the laws are adequate against the ones, most of these conversations we're talking about, the the, uh, the user side, the treatment side of it. Right. We're not talking about the supply side of it. So the suppliers, under what I just heard you say, they're not going to be curtailed at all in, in bringing more heroin in and, and more, and that's what's happening, more and more. And I'm saying, Susan's question, that the dealers, the ones that are dealing this, mm -hmm. It needs to be stopped because it's a supply and demand situation. Mm -hmm. The more users, you're going to have more suppliers, and that's what's happening. And I don't disagree with you. But when you look at the two million people that are in prison right now in the United States, more than any other country, you have to look at the risk assessments. I'm not saying that you can't arrest them. Arrest them, but then get them into treatment because they're they're part of the problem. And I think that's the only way to do it. Otherwise, we're going to have three million people in jail and or prison. How well do we do that in our prison system in the state? I think we have 17,000. How, how good a job do we do of providing treatment in our prison system? Not if you go to prison. Not at all. Well, they're beginning to have some uh, drug counseling and that, but not enough to most people come out of prison the way they went in, angry. And um, we need to do something about that. Teach them a skill. Most of them are functionally illiterate. So you have to train them to read. Otherwise, when they go out, they're going to do the same thing as when they went in because they can't get a job. The other part, kind of, of this dealing mm -hmm. question is 
um, people not not necessarily heroin, but getting hooked on uh, painkillers or something mm -hmm. like that that leads to it. The opiates. And you know the anecdotal stories you hear are they come out of the you know it gets over prescribed to someone and then they get passed around the school or someone knows where to buy right. that stuff. Um, would you be in favor of something that tracks medication better? Do you think the state should get more involved on the doctor level of monitoring oh, what's being absolutely. That's is, that in, is that too intrusive, or where, where's the line that's okay? Well, to I think that it is intrusive to a certain extent, but where do you draw the line? And, you know, you're trying to get people off this medication. I know a woman who was on fentanyl, oxycodone, and one other, and I thought, what are they doing to her? And she's off of them now. But it's very easy to get people hooked who have pain. Uh, you saw what happened when they closed that uh, pain clinic, you know, that yeah, doctor who had the seven. And people were just going wild, and they were going to the emergency rooms to try to get something for the pain that they were in. And so, you know, there's always unintended consequences to whatever actions we take. And we don't always know ahead of time what's going to happen. But I do really believe that we need education, methadone clinics, and uh, Narcan. Explain the education just real briefly, and then we'll move on. Um, OK. Like, tell me. What age? Who does it? Is it police that come in? Is it the teachers have to be trained? Is it health classes? Actually, what, you what, know, what do you think is most would be most effective? Well, the Dare program uh -huh. was touted as a wonderful program, and then it turned out that it wasn't. Uh, it didn't have the long-term effects that they thought it was going to. But I do think you have to get kids in kindergarten, first grade, because they are exposed to it with their brothers, sisters. They go into their friend's house. The parents may be using. I mean, they're all of these things. Because I think if you get children young and explain what's going on, and you keep explaining in every grade till they graduate, by then, hopefully, they will not have tried these drugs. And um, we won't have the problem anymore. Of course, every state in the nation has the same problem. Uh, the governor re recently, he kind of made an announcement on trying to get people together to work on something. What's your take on that plan? Are you optimistic that that will do something? I'm never optimistic when a plan just comes out. I want to know that it has some uh, statistical evidence that it will work. And we know that education works. We know that treatment works. And I, you know, I don't know, to be really honest with you. No, that's fine. And it was. I it was got the executive order <clears throat> and the whereas, 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 whereas. I, well, it's mostly to people talking to each other. Yes, yeah. And people should. And I don't know why they aren't. Um, do you have another question? No, I just going back to the to the, the dealer. I, I see two categories of dealers. Mm -hmm. I see the dealer um, that is a user, right, and is dealing only to you know support his or her habit. Then there's the hardcore, right, that don't drug use. pusher dealer that don't use, and they're in it for the big profit. And, they, and so those are those two very different groups. Right. And we, we have the punishments for that kind of dealer, right. because that kind of dealer you, you have to deal with. But with people who are addicted and they're just mm -hmm. selling a small amount to satisfy their own habit, uh, I don't think that they I should just go in to, forever. I, I thought that's what you yeah. were thinking of the same. But. Can, the, can the revenue, the, the marijuana initiative, had written into it that a certain percentage of that money that came to the state had to go to health education. Is that, can that money be used on something sure. like you're explaining? Or it Absolutely. doesn't have to be marijuana, it could be any. Oh, no, it, it can be any health uh, related thing. And as far as marijuana, we have really 
I mean, it's been amazing how much money the state has made. Yeah, that was something you, you had supported that. Oh, from the be very beginning. That, the only thing I don't support is, and I stood on the floor the last session for 45 minutes trying to get people to listen, the putting the medical in with the recreational, to me, is, is very bad. It's very bad because, number one, in a lot of the recreational stores, they have, you know, younger people waiting on people, and they have no idea about medical marijuana. And the bad part is somebody comes in with uh, cancer, it's on chemotherapy, and somebody said, well, this is good for pain, but it may not be good for you. You know, it may have pesticides, it may have a bad reaction. I've always thought that the medical marijuana should be separate and apart, and that that way they don't have to worry about the taxes and the uh, excise tax. Should the recreational stores be, let's say, required to have someone with that expertise? Do you think that's oh, a good thing to pursue? Absolutely, if they're going to do it that way. Because you're going to have children going into the medical part of it, the, one, the children that have seizures, the children who uh, use cannabis. I don't mean use it because no, they no, want no, to. No, it's prescribed. Right, yeah. right yeah. exactly. And so going into the recreational stores, I just, for me, I don't like that. Is that something, like, is it significant enough that that's legislation that we should be looking for? I'm, I, looking at doing that. I got a group together and we are now working on bullet points. Because I said last year, this is not a good bill, you know? And what's happened is that the Recreational Marijuana Association is the one who's controlling all of this. And the little guys are being put on. I was really impressed with what Utah did. Uh, this, you know, it's only for the chronically homeless. It is not, they have 29,000 homeless people in Utah still. But the chronically ill went from 2,500 down to 50, I think. Just by housing first, you know, go in there, nobody's going to tell you you can't smoke, you can't drink. But it seems that it really has worked, and I think we should do it. How many almost do we have? Uh, I think 14,000. I may be wrong on that. I think 14,000 in the state. Um, but we need to do these things, and you know, we should don't always have. Should it be kind of as a state Well, I think you could use a pilot program first to see if it's going to work. And then, yes, statewide, we need to have places for homeless, chronically homeless people who have diabetes or some kind of chronic disease, that we can get them off the streets, out of the emergency rooms, and try to give them the resources that they need <clears throat> Excuse me, my allergies are going crazy today. Um, I just think that we have to do something like that. I mean, we've been talking about homelessness now for years, and we haven't done anything to really change the statistics. If I understand what you're saying, and I think this is interesting, to you, addressing the chronic is kind of the number one thing to do. Yes. Is because they're such a because they're such a, the and they're, and they're such a drain yes. on society. They're, you're still going to have a huge homeless population, but if you can get all those chronically ill people into housing, then you can start working on the others. Maybe when I um, when I said should it be statewide, I think everyone agreed. Yes, we pay attention everywhere. What I what I was kind of getting at is Utah. They told us. What really kind of helped was to have a one person, that state leader, who did that. We don't really have that. In no, the state. It's kind of an advisory board. Right. Um, 
is that something, should we create an office or something like that? Um, so it's, do we need better organization, better leadership, and what would that look like to you? Uh, well, we definitely need leadership in it because legislators are too busy. They can't really get to the meat of the subject when we're in session. So we have to find people who really understand homelessness and chronic homelessness. And maybe we should invite that man, I can't remember his name. Yeah, maybe we should invite him here and, uh, not here, but down in the legislature and see if we can mirror what they've done. Um, I think it's great. One of the candidates um, uh -huh. that we interviewed was concerned that um, when you get a great you know, housing program going that people from other states will move in and will just be exacerbating our homelessness problem. It never happened with Utah. And I think the reason why is that they have a list of people and they go by the names. You know, when a, a apartment opens up, then the next person on the list gets to go. And as long as we keep lists, and as long as we are aware of homeless people coming in, but it, just because you're homeless, you're not going to get housing. Do you agree with, um, so Seattle has become very aggressive on this lately. Uh, the last couple of weeks, there have been mm -hmm. sweeps of places like the jungle where a lot of crime is occurring. Um, do you think that's what's needed? Do, you, do, do they have to get tough on things like that at a certain point? Should we? Should more communities be following that? Lead? Well, I do think you have to get tough. You don't have to be brutal, and you don't have to be mean, and you don't have to use a weapon, but you have to clean up those areas where you know there's drugs being passed back and forth. Where I mean, they found a 14-month-old baby there yesterday. Now it's in Child Protective Services. But, I mean, we have to do something. And having, um, I just, trying to get my thoughts uh, together. Just having um, somebody who would take the lead and help this. And with the uh, different sites where there's drugs, we need to figure out a way to get rid of those areas. But the one thing I don't agree with Seattle is that they want to just clean it all out. Well, where are the homeless going to go? Well, they started the problem. The mayor yes, decided you're right. they were going to be a sanctuary city. And so the word goes out. All these people come in. They've spent tens of millions of dollars over the last decade in this aimless program that doesn't solve the problem, doesn't come close to solving the problem, mm -hmm. and that's why they're camped at, under I-5, and, and, and now he turns around, and they're going to clean it all up. I mean, there's no consistency there with what's mm -hmm. going on. He's a horrible example. Well, that's true. We need uh, those tiny homes, which is part of zoning. They don't have to be great two-story, you know, whatever. But if you have tiny homes, people have a roof over their head. If they have a roof over their head and a bathroom. That gives them back some of their dignity. I was going to ask you. They don't cost a lot to build. What? They do not cost no, a they lot don't. to build. I was going to ask if you've seen any sort of, you know, earlier you mentioned you like the idea of pilot programs. Yeah. Like, do you see anything across the state as you look at this issue that, that's working um, in a community or in a municipality? No, I haven't seen any. Um, how I got involved in homelessness, because I don't usually work on homelessness, is that um, one of my uh, colleagues wanted to allow churches in Spokane, this was just for Spokane, to bring in families. And I, he said, will you prime the bill for me? And I said, yes, because he was a Republican. And I took more flack from the church, the Catholic church, than I have ever. And what I was trying to get to, and I think this is what Kevin was trying to get to, is that shelters don't take families. 
they take the man or they take the woman with children, but they can't be together. What did the bill try to do? And the bill tried to say that families could use the churches as uh, shelters. And then they have to leave in the morning. But what happened, <coughs> most of the churches were 1930, and they didn't have the safety uh, issues. That was why they were uncomfortable. That's why they were uncomfortable with it. I mean, even though they had monitors all night uh -huh. long, and that it's not an easy problem to solve. Well, that characteristic, because people who are in the upper stratosphere here of uh, making money, they can go anywhere to get their product. They can go online, they can go to Oregon, they can go to uh, Nevada and buy at a cheaper rate. But the poor have nowhere to go. They have to buy what's available to them. And if they don't have any transportation, that's even worse. So is there a way, I think you know, that's an interesting concept that you bring up, is there a way to change just sales tax themselves? You know, capturing, I, I know this was, an, this was an issue with Amazon, I believe, on capturing sales tax. Right, the streamline uh, stuff. Um, are, are there things like that that could be improved in our system just to make it more effective, for one thing, that we're actually capturing the sales that happen? But I still think it would only affect those that uh, middle class and higher, because most poor people don't have a laptop. They don't have anything to be able to get into those areas around the country that don't have sales tax. So that's, it is a regress. But I've told you, what, this is my seventh time, that um, the fairest form of taxation would be an income tax. And I believe that wholeheartedly because then the middle class and the uh, upper classes would have to pay their fair share. And with the poor, you could exempt them. You know, if you make under $10,000, we're going to exempt you, and, or something like that. But I believe in it. And uh, Bill Gates Sr. had said, if we had an income tax, we could, to those 335,000 businesses, we could get rid of the B&O tax, which is the most regressive tax. We're the only state that has it. And they're taxing on gross receipts, not on net. And then uh, to have the sales tax, so right now it's, what, 8.8. .8, so it would be 4.4. .4. And then the other is, um, oh, shoot, Sherry. Let's see. Oh. Capital gains? No. Um, property tax? Yes. Get rid of the state's portion of the property tax. Of, okay. So the trade off you would propose, because this is unpopular and voters right. said no, oh. you would propose a trade off of eliminating BO taxes, cutting property taxes, kind of taking away the right. state portion, and kind of in half. Sales tax cuts in half. Right. At least the. And I think way. that's fair. And I think it actually, we're being nickeled and dimed to death with all these little taxes. I think it would be nice to just... That, that's my concern if you say, okay, we're going to have a half, we're going to have 4% sales tax. Uh -huh. Ten years from now, what's it going to be? So well, that, that you have it and then it, it's like getting the camel's nose under, you keep eating it up and... Well, you have to delay it. But first of all, if we wanted to ever pass it, and it's never going to happen in my lifetime or yours, but if we were going to do it, we have to do it as a constitutional amendment so that any time the legislature wanted to raise taxes, they couldn't do it without a vote of the people. And I think that's the only thing that will ever get it through. Would you, do you think that would be, I mean, Tim Iman tries to do 